nyali panjelang ni rakol jugun nyali gani garama mala jugun so now it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Tyson Yanka Porter, um, whose voice has resonated across the airwaves and indeed in print since the publication in September 2019 of his groundbreaking book, Sand Talk, How Indigenous Thinking Can Save the World. Importantly in the book, Tyson looks back or reverses the gaze onto global systems, current global systems, from an Indigenous perspective. He asks how contemporary life diverges from the pattern of creation, how this affects us and how we could do things differently. The book provides a template for living and questions how we learn and how we remember. Most of all, it's about Indigenous thinking and how it can save the world. Clearly, our current ways of thinking are not supporting a strong and sustainable society. If ever there was a need for a less simplistic, more nuanced approach, it's now. Indigenous knowledges know the world is complex and that to simplify it is to destroy it. Dr. Tyson Yunker Porter is an academic, an arts critic, a researcher and author. He belongs to the Appalach clan in far north Queensland. He carves traditional tools and weapons and is a senior lecturer in Indigenous Knowledges at Melbourne's Deakin University. Welcome, Tyson. Hey, how are you doing? Doing pretty good, are you? Good to see you. From your perspective, what's been the general reaction to the book Sand Talk? Um, well, it's been pretty huge. I, I think the, the publishers really thought it was going to be a very minor thing. You know, they, they didn't think it was going to do well at all. Um, you know, they thought we might do a couple of thousand tops or something. And I was happy with that. You know, it was just, I don't know, it was just supposed to be a little thing. So I wasn't really prepared for, you know, how big it went. Um, and it's funny, it's all been all word of mouth. I haven't done any television or anything like that. The, the PR has been really limited because uh, I told them for the start that I wasn't really into branding myself or anything. I'm, uh, I'm not really into that. Um, so they kind of thought, oh, well, this, we're not going to sell any of these. But yeah, then off it went. Grapevine, grapevine way. It, <laughs> yeah, it really took off. And the reaction's been huge, really positive. Um, I've had some negative reactions from people who haven't read it. And they're just sort of upset that I wrote anything at all. But apart from that, anyone who's read it seems to like it pretty good. Um, yeah, this, it's... Uh, Really, it's a vehicle for old man Jorma's knowledge. He wanted me to get these uh, those symbols, the sand talk symbols. There's about half a dozen of them there that he really, you know, he asked me, I don't know, nearly a decade ago now to, to get those out into the world. And so I'd just been going around doing it one-on-one -on -one with people or even just with groups, you know, um, or with, you know, bigger audiences, maybe 500 people in a keynote or something like that. Um, yeah, and I just thought it was going to take forever to get those out there. But then, yeah, so the book was kind of a vehicle to get those out there because they change you. Like, uh, so people's reaction has been, oh, this book changed me. And like people are saying things like it's changed them at the molecular level, you know, um, that they feel just changed in their body and spirit and they, they don't know why. And, they, and they're quoting bits from the book and going, oh, maybe that's it. And it's like people are reading it and go, well, that's not that special. It's not really in the words. It's in, um, or anything that I say, it's in old man Juma's symbols. Because see, the first time I saw that, he's from the Larrakia mob there. And so first time I went up there and sat with him on his country and he, he spent the day just drawing all these things, you know, on the ground, um, it hurt me, you know. Like uh, I had a headache for about three months afterwards because I was still all in my head then, you know, I was still trying to contain my mind in my brain. Yeah. And so it just exploded out. And when I finally let go and let it go through my body and then out to all my relationships all around me and 
the objects I was making and everything else. And it, it just, uh, yeah, it just, it just liberated and changed me a lot. And I think a lot of people have those images are working on them, you know, it's doing their work. <laughs> and that's sort of what he wants. It's a big uh, ceremonial action, ritual action that um, he wants to bring all the seven spirit families back home again. Um, yeah, that's gone out through the world. So for him, he says, this is a very exciting time in history because all the seven bloods, seven families are all here again from the place where they were born out from. He's not into the out of Africa theory. Oh man, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, didn't the out of Africa uh, theory people dispute their own theory? Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, there's a lot of problems with it. Yeah. It's just unfortunately, a lot of the scholarship about it is, is just weird stuff, you know? Mm. Yeah. There's too many aliens and stuff in there or whatever. But um, yeah, there's one guy, I can't remember the book now. I've, I've got, it's on the list of things in the back. Back of the book there, I put a list of books that are good to read. Uh, it was called The Into Africa Theory. <laughs> and yeah, he's, he argues that it came out of this region, you know, that, uh, and he argues it pretty well too. I'd yeah. love to read that. Yeah, it's the reason why every time there's a, you know, when there's a discovery in Australia that pushes the date back for human occupation, yeah. <laughs> um, that they always come back to like 40,000 or 65,000 years. Yeah. It's because the out of Africa theory doesn't work. Ah. With the dates. It, it, it can, it, at a stretch, it'll go to 65. Right. People being here. But um, beyond that, it gets a bit tricky. That's interesting. I thought work, the so. five thousand year mark might, might have been the the time at which our measuring sticks um, measured and couldn't measure any further than that. Yeah, that was the forty thousand. That yeah. was the forty thousand year one. So they said they used to go. It was at least forty thousand years because that was as far as the dating back in the day used to go. Yeah. But then they got thermoluminescence and some other dating techniques, and yeah. Plus, it's it's hard if you find something in the sediment from 120,000 years ago, <laughs> with that's what that layer is, it, it, and you're digging it out of that layer, and it's never been disturbed. Then that's a hard one to uh, mess Reach. with. Yeah. 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 So you know, so the the response to the book has been pretty awesome, um, as you say. You know, I've, I've noticed the same and. Have you been surprised by the book's popularity, particularly with non-Indigenous Australian people? Yeah, I just the, the volume of, of the popularity has been a bit frightening and that wasn't expected. So, you know, that makes a lot of changes in your life that I wasn't really prepared for. Um, and the stuff from non-Indigenous people, yeah, it's interesting. Because they all seem to love it. Um, yeah, especially boomers. I was saying to you before, boomers are my people. I tell you, for some somehow, it's like I'm their mascot or something. They love it. Um, yeah. So I'm like, um, what do they say? Um, I'm like, okay, boomer, like that. I can just say it a bit different. Yeah, because they're buying my book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think, you know, it seems to me that, uh, perhaps we're hungry for alternate ways of, of thinking and, and knowing and being in the world, you know. So I think perhaps, mm. you know, your book's pretty timely, right? Yeah. The time yeah. has been pretty good, mate. Yeah. 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 And there's that kind of, I don't know, there's that Freudian or Jungian, I can't remember which theorist, but I think there's that death wish thing going on <laughs> I don't know with with some of the you know I, I did this I did this thing at the Adelaide Festival where I was talking about the the aging population you know in, in white Australia and then but it's the opposite in the Aboriginal community yeah that's right you know so you know average age our average age is kids you know and we're um you know and and most I mean, about half of our relationships are with non-Aboriginal people. And I talked to a statistician at, at ANU and he, he crunched the numbers and came up with, he said, oh man, by the end of this century, at the current rates of um, Aboriginal people 
you know, mating with non-Aboriginal people and then the kids retain their identity, if it keeps going at that rate, end of the century, everyone in Australia will be Aboriginal. So everyone will be Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. Um, so yeah, that, that was pretty exciting. And I don't know, and I said that and it's like, you know, wow, okay, so, um, you know, white Australia is going to be extinct by the end of the century one way or another. And all these boomers are there like, you know, because that's my audience. That <laughs> All these crowds, they're all, all, you know, these silver nomads and they're all out there like, you know, they're all cheering and clapping their hands. I'm like, oh, all right, that's... Uh, A stark difference to yeah. the... the uh, the early 20th century in Australia. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was on that uh, Virginia Trioli uh, on the radio too, on that show, and um, I was talking about that theory in relation, because she was looking for an Aboriginal perspective, like uh, bringing pattern thinking to looking at the when the COVID-19 first broke. Mm -hmm. That was in the first, like when you actually still go into the studio and record the interview. Oh. So that was when it first came out. And I went, ah, oh, well, like, you know, that's, uh, that just pushes that date forward back a, a bit more. It might take another century because um, when a population's threatened, um, what always happens is they breed like mad. <laughs> so, <laughs> is that right? Yeah. So, um, you know, I guess there might be a lot of, uh, kind of mating going on in non-Aboriginal <laughs> Australia over the next, especially if we keep locking them up in the houses together. Yeah. They're either going to kill each other or whatever each other. And, and, and I think we're gonna get, yeah. yeah, we're going to get a whole new baby boom out of this one, I reckon. <laughs> it's going to be beautiful. I wonder what that'll yeah. be like. Yeah. So, um, I guess one of the things that we focus on or, or have been sort of, aiming toward focusing on um, in the Nagara Institute is, is that of the necessity for decolonization. Yeah. Um, and which requires a, a, a depth of understanding about colonialism. Mm. Yeah. And so wondering what your perspective is on the role of colonialism mm. in the development of neoliberalism and capitalism and the current climate crisis. Yeah. Well, there's that neocolonialism is a, it's a big thing, you know, so all the resources that are needed, they've got to come from somewhere and they're not coming from England, although they're fracking a lot there, but you know, your rare earth metals are coming from other countries. And you can see since lockdown, uh, the U S has taken that opportunity to really ramp up its empire building. Um, there's a lot of, I mean, they've really, really increased their military activities while no one's looking. Um, you know, there's about 12 different wars they're fighting right now that they've really ramped up through the roof. I mean, no one knows what's going on in Somalia. No one's talking about that or tweeting about it. Um, you know, this uh, neocolonialism's horrendous. You know, basically Africa is just um, is just being raped to to keep Europe going. You know, and um, particularly you know since China rolled back its production of rare earth metals. We've had a lot of trouble around the world. Um, so, you know, on Aboriginal land, they're opening up a lot of rare earth mines here. And it's the processing plants that I'm worried about on Aboriginal land too, because, um, you know, it's the most toxic radioactive, you know, refining process known to man. Mm. Uh, refining those rare earth metals. They're the things that make your freaking phone work, that make this computer work. You know, everyone thinks this tech is just forever, but that's a rare earth metal. Mm. And, you know, you've got to store all the radioactive waste for that for, you know, 3,000, 10,000 years. You know, I've heard conservative estimates of 3,000 years because that's, you know, that it's only going to give you a few cancers or something. It won't kill you outright by then. But, I mean, yeah, it's pretty horrifying. So I think China got worried when their plants stopped flowering. That's, that sounds like a worry. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, they've rolled back production. So, I mean, it's pretty much, it's necessary. People talk about colonialism like it's a thing in the past, but, you know, for us to be able to have this meeting, we need colonialism. Um, we need people to continue to be, you know, genocided, displaced, removed, dispossessed, because uh, you've got to get people off those land if you're going to get to that uh, rare earth metals, eh? 
and the rest, you know, to power it. So the Internet of Things is coming out this year. And so that's uh, 40 billion devices coming out this year, sensors to uh, basically to be able to record every aspect of physical reality in real time and upload it to servers, um, you know, everywhere. And of course the servers are the things that worry me because they're massive buildings, you know, they need lots of servers, uh, the amount of energy and heat that produces. And then all these blockchains are horrendously energy intensive as well. Um, and the amount of energy it takes just to cool those things, mm. uh, you know, the infrastructure that's needed for that. It's just, it's absolute insanity. They'd be rolling this out now. And, um, but of course they have to, you know, we're kind of, uh, racing towards the end. And I think a lot of, you know, whatever we might tweet about on the ground or talk about in these little zoom meetings and stuff going, Oh yeah, no, we've got to be sustainable. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it's, it's just really funny to me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, to talk about sustainability on one of these death machines is, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Why are we like surge towards it? So anyway, that's Ironic. neo-colonialism, decolonization. We don't really have a model of that that works. India's model. Do we want to copy that? Um, Zimbabwe. Uh, I think. I think. Yeah, but Mozambique. Let's go with Mozambique. We'll go with that decolonial model. Is that is that a good one for us? Well, um, <laughs> I think. I think a lot of a lot of thinkers. Uh, that's exactly where they're at. Is you know what. Watch, what is that going to look like? You yeah. Know, we can't go back. We can't really recycle any of the models yeah. um, that we yeah. have right now. And, yeah. uh, and so, you know, that, that's what we need to do as a, as a collective, I think, is to, to imagine um, how decolonisation might look. Yeah, and so we'd be the change we want to see in the world, okay? Totally. You know, so we're all encouraged, as everybody is in the, every good neoliberal subject is, is expected to self-manage. And so we brought that self-management side, that, uh, that neoliberal culture, you know, into our approach to decolonization. So we're like, um, you know, we're doing a lot of self-reflexive work to decolonize ourselves. Right. You know, we're decolonizing our minds and, you know, we're changing our language and... Right. You know, we're, we're making everything like, because we're working ourselves first. You change, change yourself and then that'll change the world. Yeah. Um, but it's, I mean, every empire in history, every civilization, that's how they've controlled the population. They usually put out a religion that does that. It focuses everybody's critique into self-critique and looking inwards and finding the sin and purging the sin and recycling slash praying the the gay away or whatever it is you need to pray away, you know? Um, and so off we go. Um, we navel gaze our way towards the abyss. It's, um, it's, uh, <laughs> it's heaps of fun. <laughs> yeah. The problems of our time, certainly. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if it's okay, I might go and take a couple of comments from, from the attendees. Sweet. We've got some, um, We've got some action in the Q and A box. All right. So what have we got? One hundred and one of them, or uh... my spectacles. Um, yeah. So Seji Edward, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, um, has made a comment and asked a question. Re mm. boomers. Boomers. I just read it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so for for every for everyone who can't see this question, um, Seji asks. Do you think it's to do with boomers having lived for longer? We've seen life before the rape and pillage became extreme. So they've seen life before the rape and pillage became extreme. Yeah. Um, Seji's boomer friends and he discuss how life used to be simpler, slower, and we were brought up to respect the land and all that it carries. Mm. So is that it? Is, that, is it because... Boomers have kind of been through a cycle of this. Yeah. But it's also, I mean, uh, you know, when they went to turn the Titanic and they seen the iceberg and they had that wheel right around. Yeah. yeah. Still kept going straight for a half a K or something. <laughs> yeah. Before it finally started to turn. You know, you knock on effects from uh, rape and pillage 
you know, they, they tend to take a while to kick in, you know? So I guess, uh, it's that moment before the tree falls and it's just hanging by a thread and it's still standing there. You know, that I guess the boomers got to stand around and say, what a beautiful tree. Yeah. You know, that's lovely. And then, <laughs> and then like, I don't know. Who they, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's funny because they were fighting against the rape and the pillage, you know, they had all that counterculture and, um, right. you know, they, they did struggle, but what they didn't have was knowledge. You know, they had all the feeling and they, they didn't have the knowledge and somehow they never lost the feeling, you know, even when they were locked into their little boxes and cages because they had to, to survive, you know, and they did the work and they, they dug the coal and all the rest and, you know, got paid more than a school principal for holding a stop sign in a mine you know, completely unskilled, didn't need to have any education or anything, you know. Uh, and then they were like, I don't know, got three houses and three garages full of quad bikes and surf skis and stuff that they zoom around in the muddy river, you know. Um, yeah, they got to enjoy. They got to enjoy unfettered the, the last of the bounty of nature uh, before the, you know, I mean, there were signs before that it was all dying, but you could still walk through it and go, God, that looks pretty. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And I guess, yeah, of course they'd miss that. You know, I miss that. I'm 47. I remember like, you know, going to those places where the, the fish were just thick in the water. You could just pull them out of the stream, you know? Mm. And then you go back uh, 30 years later and, and there's just nothing there. You know, it, it used to be you couldn't hear the person talking next to you for the birds in the forest, you know, yeah. that cacophony. And now, now you're standing there in the same spot, like three decades later, like, well, that's a bird. I can hear a bird, you know, <laughs> where's all the fish gone? It still looks beautiful. There's a lot of tourists taking photos, but that's dead. I look at that ecosystem and it's just dead. And the, those trees are just, you know, they dead men walking, just standing there, ready to <laughs> ready to drop. You see all the dieback. Um, yeah, but there's a lot of reasons for that. And it's not just climate change. There's, um, you know, that biocide is on a massive scale and there are cascading effects. Yeah. And those effects become exponential, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So perhaps as um, Seji has later suggested that uh, Mother Earth's going to sort us out. Right? Yeah. Yeah, well, it's shaking itself now like a dog, <laughs> I guess, in a lot of ways. Yeah, get some of those fleas off. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Joel um, Ford has um, put up a question. He's a, a teacher and he really enjoyed the chapter in your book on education called the chapter yeah. called Advanced and Fair. And he asks if you'd mind sharing, he'd love to hear more of your thoughts about how education can actively challenge and reinvent a failing system. Well, it's like, uh, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I really love learning. And, you know, so as a lover of learning, I just, I just, um, I can't be involved in the education system anymore for I've, it's cause it's, it's, it's just not about learning. You know, I like with all our institutions, there's, there's the stated purpose that we all adhere to and believe in. And then there's the real purpose. And I'm not sure what the real purpose of uh, education is, but it's certainly not learning. So, I mean, you look at this situation now, you know, find all, all these kids are doing their learning from home, you know, and the teachers are getting together all the, the learning that they would have done in that day. And the kids are knocking it over in an hour, hour and a half, <laughs> the lot. Yeah, yeah. And they're like, what's the rest of the six, seven hours for? Um, you know, that, <laughs> ah, I don't know if it was about increasing learning outcomes, you know, maximizing learning outcomes, 
then we'd be using the best techniques. And we've known for decades what the best learning techniques are. You know, there were like Russian cognitive scientists bloody 40 years ago telling us what they were. And, you know, we've known, you know, the best techniques for, for decades. We're not using them. No. You know, we've never used them. Um, yeah. I don't know if anybody remembers the, the 2010 documents. If anyone was a teacher in the late nineties, they'll remember these, especially in Queensland, they were really pushed. And it was like, soon these kids, oh, everyone's going to have a device they can carry around in their hand and they can access, there'll be video, video on the device. They'll be able to access any knowledge from around the planet in real time, anywhere. All learning will be student centered. It's going to be decentralized. You know, schools won't be schools anymore. Kids won't have to attend. It'll be like an education hub and, and, and kids will get like, uh, you know, a budget where they can spend money on what they want to learn and they can download eduware and all this stuff was happening, you know, and um, we're all being asked to start adjusting our teaching and start to get up on the tech and get ready for this big revolution where they said a teacher with a whiteboard was going to be like a blacksmith, you know, finished. Maybe something you look at at a reenactment or something like that. Um, it didn't happen. I still got it now. Like, ah, oh, they got, uh, they got AI tech now they're, they're, they're bringing in where they can have a neural net. I've seen photos of these. They're developing them in Oxford and Harvard and all these places. Um, really big business funded by very big companies and uh, asset management funds and all these things. But yeah, they, every student's got a neural net on their head and the teacher's got these glasses where they can see a hologram above the neural net and read the student's data like uh, what they're thinking in real time. You know, so you can tell if a student's engaged or not engaged and all that data is being uploaded to servers. So the students are like uh, sources of data for AIs to graze on kind of thing. Um, they were very excited about that. So all, all the, the possibilities for this tech, all this AI in learning, you know, to liberate learners, to be able to free range through and learn like six languages or whatever they want to do. Advanced calculus, every, they could do whatever they wanted. But not because you, you see the trial schools where they're being used and the kids are still sitting in desks in rows. It looks exactly the same. The, <laughs> it's exactly the same as it was 100 years ago. Yep. The education, they got it the same way. The kids are still doing worksheets, man. Like that's all this tech is there just to, to surveil the students. <laughs> yes, it's about that. They're still it's doing worksheets. You know, yeah. for what? You know, for lower level literacy drills and numeracy drills over and over. You know, it's back to basics and, and someone else's version of history. And, it, you know, they're like, stuff this. I go, oh, I'm going to go and get on TikTok. <laughs> Do some so, poxy so dance to... just with my dead eyes. Just. <laughs> <laughs> so what do we do to reinvent this? Twerk, twerk, twerk. <laughs> What do we do about it? How do we reinvent a system that's failing? <sighs> we listen to the Russians. <laughs> There's no nations anymore. <laughs> <laughs> All those sovereign boundaries, are, they're gone. The economy's gone way past that. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah, that's true. It's, 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 it's all digital. Well, now, so economies are digital. The, right. And the, 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 the boundaries in cyberspace are, are not you know, they don't give a stuff about your geographical boundary or what language you speak True. or anything else, you know, and, and money doesn't care about that. Uh, all these nations have lost their sovereignty and they don't realize it yet. It's that Titanic. They've turned the wheel, but it's not moving yet. You know? Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Sovereignty is soon going to be an issue for everybody, which is why you're seeing all these big backlashes and Brexits and stuff like that. And, yeah. You know, hyper nationalism and stuff. It's a, it's a, it's a feeling you know, response, a felt response, because they know they've lost something, but they can't put their finger on it. So they've got to make up conspiracy theories about 5G. <laughs> yeah. Yes, indeed. Yeah. But um, yeah, all that's gone. That's gone, long gone. You know, all the, even billionaires, people keep telling me about all, ah, oh, there's more billionaires now than ever, but no, they've been dying off. You check the figures, 
You know, there's plenty of Swedish studies that tell you who's got what in the world. And billionaires are endangered species. They were exponentially decreasing for the last decade. You know, all the money now is in the big um, asset management funds, you know. Um, yeah. And they're like, they're like quintillionaire bloody things. All, all their money is there. You know, Bill Gates wants to do something. He's got to go in and bloody <laughs> walk into that big asset management fund and say, oh, hello, sirs. Like, could I just get some? I need to get a few million out for these vaccines. Can I have that? <laughs> you know, uh, it's just like, yeah, the, the world's, it's a, it's a completely different thing at the moment. Um, and this isn't to like decrease hope. It's just to go, ah, well, this is happening and we're gonna go through it. It's also very, very fragile, very flimsy. There's a lot of bottlenecks in its system, a lot of complex supply chains that are breaking down. And, um, you know, I think we're gonna find there'll just be a bit of a return to regionalism. And then for people with their heart in the right place, connect to people, a bit of a, bit of a return to bioregionalism. You know, we start to allow these local cultures and economies to arise, but hopefully in syndicated interdependent ways with all the other regions, mm. because otherwise you end up with one region running out of toilet paper and running over and killing everybody in the next. So, uh, yeah, I, if you're looking for a model of that, I guess you just look at the Tyndale map of Australia. <laughs> you know, so, you know, we did manage to retain all those separate cultures and languages for a very long time. And, even have quite a bit of warfare, but managed to do that without invasion and theft of land and genocide and all that kind of thing. Um, and it was because of that syndicated complex economic system that we had for so long. Yeah. And perhaps the pandemic is going to be, um, has been, you know, maybe been, everything happens for a reason, a lot of people say, and maybe the pandemic is going to force us back into those regional clusters. And yeah. a lot of people have been talking about, you know, when things get back to normal. And mm. uh, certainly myself and, uh, and other people I know, I, I don't think I want to go back to mm. that, mm. what what that is or what yeah. that was. Like how, could, how can we emerge out of this perhaps in, in, a, in better shape? Yeah. Than when we went into it so um well look you know if you disrupt an ecosystem you know the animals in that ecosystem that that start to become displaced and sick and desperate and mobile and trying to find some way to survive you know they get stressed and so they get sick and they throw up pathogens and this is really going to continue until we you know basically go oh okay uh, we need a habitat <laughs> We need a habitat for all the animals because otherwise they're going to be running along and somebody will get a bit of guts on them from, I don't know, something gets hit by a truck and then there'll be like, you know, koala AIDS is going to rip through the goddamn, <laughs> you know, uh, rip through us all or something. You know, it's, um, yeah, uh, things like pandemics, these are not, the, it's not the center of things, you know. COVID-19 is a, a comorbidity of, of ecosystem damage. You know, the land is sick. And so, you know, we're going to get sick with it. It's a comorbidity problem, not uh, a problem in and of itself. Not another thing that we need to defeat in nature. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great, uh, great way to put it. It's interesting how so many, um, you know, public speakers and politicians have been, it's amazing how our language, the English language at least, is so militarised and we can't yeah. think of our response to this pandemic as anything but a war. You know, so many people are putting it in those terms. Yeah. Um, I really like the way you've summed it, summed it up as a comorbidity. Yeah. Um, along with the sick... sick. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And that that's, comes through with that holistic thinking. You know, um and there's one, there's a chapter that I have on that in the book. Hey, I actually, I've got, you know how in the book I'm, I do like a carving for each chapter? Yeah. I've never showed anybody those carvings. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to see some? Yes. <laughs> so well, here's that one. While you do that, I'll just get my yeah. power. 
here's that one for that uh, yeah that was from that uh yeah, the one that talks about you know indigenous bush medicine and stuff like that and the uh, holistic methods of inquiry that produce those systems of knowledge you know um yeah so that's that uh that little yuck point there wow uh, from that chapter yeah i got a few of them here that advanced and fair yeah, we've got that one we've got uh Hey, the other education one, just while we're on that one, was one of my favorites. It's the displaced apostrophes. So there's those apostrophes. <laughs> hey, I'm not going to do that for long because it's nighttime. I don't know what's going to come through the window at me. <laughs> Start. <laughs> you know, when you're off country, you don't want to do anything at night because <laughs> you don't know what's going to come. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I got a few of them things here. Um, yeah, and, and this one too, that, uh, that, that, uh, chapter on gender with that, uh, Kulamon here, this is the one I made for my little son. Ah, oh, that's beautiful. Diver, that's, so when he was born, he went into this one. That was already carrying around him. Um, yeah, he's the little fellow. He's named after his great grandfather. Um, and his great grandfather, nobody knows where he came from, but, because he just got captured out in the bush in uh, the Mitchell River up in uh, North Queensland. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so they called him Diver Mitchell because he tried to escape from the police by diving into the Mitchell River. So, so we named, yeah, we named our boy after him, Diver. Nice. Yeah. yeah. That, that's beautiful. Yeah. 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 So he, he finally got to escape after a few generations. <laughs> anyway. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's awesome. Thanks for showing. So you, you reckon that no, this is the first time you've shown anybody? Yeah, yeah. Nobody's seen these. Um, wow. What I, a think, I think some people seen this one because that's the one I was using. Um, instead of signing the books, I was doing like a rubbing. Okay. In them off, off this one. That's that. Uh, yeah, that's the one from the lines. Uh, no, which one? Yeah, that that's the one where I was talking about that um, the big patterns. Um, so this shows all the the freshwater and saltwater and the movement of sand along the coast. Wow! On a really complex system. Yeah, so talking about that uh, sort of all those big fractal patterns, you know, that come out of that story, that turtle story. Mm -hmm. And then uh, this one is kind of related to that. Comes out of that pattern mind business so that uh the pattern thinking yep and you can so you can see all what happens when you start to take that symbol through to its natural conclusion it's kind of creates a whole heap of so I, I guess complexity theory is a big one uh and complexity theory is a good way to come to indigenous knowledge i think um you know if you're coming from outside of in, indigenous knowledge it's a good way to start to you know um conceptualize it yeah, so cause, mm, I draw on a lot of complexity theory things because I feel like it's aligning a lot with our knowledge systems. Yeah, you know? and, and you, talk, you talked um, in, in the podcast I listened to, um, you talked about the difference between something that is complex, whether it's a social system or, mm. or whatever, or a biological um, being, um, and and you compared that as as distinct or distinguished that of complexity to something yeah. that might be complicated. Yeah. Talk a little bit to that. Yeah, I think I um, was that the one where I was talking about the space fungus. Yeah, that, <laughs> that blew my mind. Yeah, yeah. So the International Space Station. <laughs> yeah. So that's a complicated system the international space station. Um, but the fungus that's currently just taking it over <laughs> that they can't kill because it's adapting too fast. It adapts faster than the poisons they're trying to use to eradicate it. You know, um, yeah, they're pretty much, they're going to have to abandon that station at some stage. <laughs> it's just going to be this big chunk of fungus out in there in space, you know, and it's adapting so fast. So that's a, that's a complex system. Yeah. You know, and biotic systems tend to be um, a complex system is self self organizing. 
and it responds to disruptions and just moves you know around it you know so if you uh if you cut yourself that heals because your body's a, a complex system but if you cut your computer it's like well that's fucked now yeah you're gonna have to get that fixed you gotta take it to the shop <laughs> you know because it's a complicated system so that's the difference between complex and complicated yeah, at a really yeah. simple level i think yeah i love that space station thing though that's it's my favorite a, story it's a fantastic way to explain you know really complex yeah steps and ideas isn't it yeah you know, uh, well i mean eventually all those satellites up there are going to have to come back down i mean they, they will crash back through the atmosphere at some stage hmm. some stage like centuries or maybe a millennium in the future like that space station is going to come back to earth it's going to be bringing with it like a, a new species that's the developed out in a highly radioactive environment you know and so it's radioactive resistant you know and maybe that's the thing in the worst case scenario that's going to reseed everything you know so good on that international cooperation there with the space station you know? well good on the fungus the complex um yeah the complex uh, biological um being that's big yeah. the, the complicated technology yeah. Yeah. what's the spirit of that going to look like you know yeah because fungus is everything you know it's uh, we're basically just vehicles for fungus mm. you know so much of our body's just got fungus in it you know you get rid of it and you die and like all through as you know that's part of the way how trees talk to each other is along these mycelial networks under the ground that's how old fellows used to be able to communicate through some trees you know hundreds of miles be able to sit down and connect to someone else sit in another tree and communicate that way i guess it was the world's first internet you know that's been happening for a long time it, fungus is um you know the spirit fungus spirit is just terrifyingly sentient yeah 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 terrifyingly I sentient. Think, you know i've read and, and and heard that that you know there's some scientists and and others around the world who are, are beginning to see that um that fungus can save the world yeah yeah fungus well it save us and save the world yeah well it uh they're just like working out all these different things that will eat it'll eat you know it'll eat up a diesel spill mushrooms you know That's completely it. clean it up you know yeah. stuff like that so you know the fungus will sort it out <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to reflect back over now onto the Q and A's. There's a few other questions um, coming through. Yeah, so I'll um, keep them brief for now. Yeah, yeah. So um, Cuba. You can you see them? Yeah. Um, there was one that 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 I kind of like because it's pretty broad and gives you license to talk about anything you like. Mm. <laughs> um, and is it can. Can you expand how we could benefit and learn from Aboriginal knowledge systems? <sighs> Big question, right? Yeah, yeah. That's from Terry, um, Terry Macon. Sorry, Terry. It's, it's, it's tricky because it's, it's problematic because um, we've left it for so long. A, a lot of our scholarship, uh, you know, a lot of our, you know, our best thinkers you know, we've thrown all of our resources and all of our best thinking into um, finding ways to try and convince people that indigenous knowledge is important and useful, you know, um, and that we need to preserve it. <laughs> um, you know, so we've been fighting those battles for generations now. Mm. And there's a critical mass of people, many of them boomers, you know, who now turn around and going, no, nah, this is important. You know, so people are, people are going, yeah, yeah, this is important. Uh, tell us, what do you got? And we're like, oh, shit. Um, I'd have just been spending so long trying to convince you that it's important. I, um, you're going to have to give me a minute. I'm going to have to. <laughs> so, you know, for a lot of us, the, the, the knowledge is like, uh, you know, we, we have it in fragmentary, you know, pieces, but we haven't done the business of all coming together and putting all those fragments together. And then we haven't done the business of sorting out how we might translate that mm. and then how we might decide what, what needs to be shared and what 
doesn't, what's useful, what's not, you know. Um, so that's where a lot of my work focuses on the how of the thinking. So the processes of indigenous thinking, because those things are they're things that people are happy to share. That's not secret or sacred knowledge. And it's not really contested too much. Those patterns are there and readily observable. And, you know, I think if you take on the pattern and you have that feeling, you know, for knowledge and you start to take on the patterns of those ways of thinking, ways of being like that, then you can just genuinely be a human being, you know. You don't have to claim, you know, oh, I'm using this Virapai wisdom or, you know, or anything like that. You know, you can just reconnect and start seeing the signs and start reading country. And then, but transfer that way of reading country, you transfer that process into everything, how you look at geopolitics, how you look at everything else. And um, you start living those patterns, it changes your language, it changes your way of relating, it changes your economic behaviors, everything. And systems tend to grow organically out of that kind of thing. You know, most things happen organically. That's why a lot of these conspiracy theories are rubbish because. Yeah. Nobody could have planned this. Yeah. This is way too complex. If anybody was smart enough to <laughs> bring this current set of circumstances about, you know, they'd have done it a lot quicker and a lot more easily, you know, and a lot more productively. Definitely. Um, yeah. So I, it's, these aren't things that you can plan or design. You know, you have to allow yourself to be designed. You know, and when you're acting as a custodian and you're just moving, you know, through the landscape and through community and economies and everything else, and you're allowing yourself to be shaped, you know, by the system and by your interactions with all respectful interactions with all the other components of those systems. You know, you're sitting down and having a yarn with your Trump supporters and all the rest, you know, and you're allowing yourself to connect and relate on those deeper levels. Think things um they just start to grow, you know, any movement that's ever stuck, you know, any system that's ever lasted has always been a self-organizing system. You know, uh, it's the minute you start to try and tinker with it or design it or, uh, you know, plan it or anything like that, that, that it all just, it's doomed from that moment. So what I'm hearing is that each of us is part of the pattern yeah for the way forward for a better way forward yeah there's a pattern and, and you can live it and we, we we can be part of that pattern yeah and it's an organic pattern yeah so so it it won't work if we try to engineer that pattern too closely yeah well if you think about it in complexity theory terms there's two really handy uh English words for that, and that's some um, homeostasis and hysteresis. Okay. And homeo homeostasis is the complexity that I was talking about before, you know, where you, if you cut yourself, your body will heal itself, you know. So a system that's stable, it has that homeostasis. Okay. The disruptions to it, it can correct that. Yep. But then you also have hysteresis, which is, um, you know, when you have big cataclysmic changes and the entire system, like, uh, you know, it, it completely transforms itself and must transform itself. And they're incredibly violent events. Right. And most systems, all systems at some stage in their lifespan over deep time are going to experience that kind of hysteresis. And, you know, we're in a moment of hysteresis now and each mm -hmm. of us is just one particle, one node in a system that's going through that. And, you know, you got to allow yourself to go through that pain and upheaval and, you know, learn as you go, but keep connecting, keep transferring information, interacting, you know, um, you know, forming those strong bonds locally, but then interacting with other systems, you know, keeping information, matter, knowledge, energy flowing between the systems. And, and it'll, it'll settle into something because hysteresis always leads back to homeostasis and you end up with a stable system again but it's going to be real different. You know, you read that Victor Stephenson's book, Fire Country, and you talk about, he reckons it'll take a thousand years. 
to get the ecosystems back because that's how long it takes for your parent trees to grow. Yeah. So the big trees that we lost, you know, they got to come back first and they got to come back everywhere. Those really big old thousand year old trees, we need them back before it'll put country right again because they're, they're the ones that create the soil. Yeah. You know, the dominant species in any place, they're reaching down deep into the earth and they're bringing up what's needed and they're changing that soil. You know, to make all these different systems, light soil, dark soil, sandy soil, rocky soil, all these ones, mm. you know, and uh, yeah, those systems will take a thousand years to come back. Yeah, maybe we could half that if, it, if we get a bit custodial about it. Start to move with country, read country. And if you're after a book that gives you the what of that, rather than just the vague, silly how of my book, you know, you got to read Victor because <laughs> he's got the blueprint for the what. So what did you, what was that book called again? Just so everyone can fire, hear. fire country, fire country. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how, how indigenous fire management um, can save Australia. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's on my list. I've not yeah. read that yet, but. Um... Yeah. So we've been on the same wavelength there with, because mine was how indigenous knowledge can save the world. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you got a really nice echo going through there. I like it. Indeed. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, what do we got? Some um, Tilly um, has asked the question: What's your most significant memory when you were writing the book? Um, um, she admired the way it was written, so she's interested in in you know. Yeah. I don't know about significant it um because writing the book happened so fast but there were visceral sort of things that happened there i think readers experience visceral moments too you know like people keep sending me emails telling me these strange things that happen to them when they read the book you know i ran into a couple of people that were um i think they were backpackers and they just read the book and they were both just sort of have, they were just like oh my god and they said, we've got to drive out to the bush and, and sit down and think about this. And so they drove out to the bush um, down here and I was there. So <laughs> I, was, I was out, um, yeah, getting, uh, collecting grass tree sap that day. And um, yeah, these two, they showed up like they were just there and they went, oh my God, we just come out to talk about your book out here and you were there. So there's lots of things happening like that. Um, yeah, for readers. For me, the most visceral thing that happened, I think, was getting um, smashed on the head by that ghost <laughs> <laughs> in the shower. <laughs> okay. That was a funny story. Yeah. So, um, Greg Bork um, says he'd love to hear more about yarning with um, Mama Doris, about the process of induction, respect, connect, reflect, direct. Yep. Um, yeah, well, okay, that connects to that last one. Yeah. So for that, for that chapter with the spirits and everything, um, that was the shield I was making around that. Um, there was one that I forgot to take with me <laughs> when I went to stay in that haunted place. Um, so I didn't have it with me at the time. But yeah, so you... Um, I guess you can see those those spirits there. Um, yeah, so there's, you know, you're a big spirit here. So you look at these different places in your body where that spirit is, that, that strong spirit, you know, for different activities and different levels of, of activity. And I guess here's your um, uh, respect, you know, so that's your mm, big spirit work. Uh, you know, because that's uh, we see that 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 big spirit is being in your belly, you know. So that's the work of your belly, the work of your spirit. And then next, you have the work of your heart. Um, so that's connect. So respect, connect. And then um, here's the work of your head. So that's reflect. And here's the work of your hands and your feet. So that's um, that's direct. So, yeah, so a lot of people do it around the other way, especially in education and in most interventions like education, we come in and, you know, we direct and then it, it fails. So then we have to think about, oh, what the hell did we do wrong? And, you know, crunch the data and 
try and analyze, find out where it all went wrong. And then we realized we probably should have uh, sat down with community first, <laughs> made some connections and relationships. And then, so we do that. And usually they'll have a barbecue for their elders or something. <laughs> and then five minutes before they leave, that's when they find that respect. Yeah. And, you know, fly out. <laughs> yeah. Um, better late than never, I guess. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. But it, it's not, it, it's, you know, that, that what um, Artie describes as, as sort of happening the wrong way around, that's the way it happens from, from my observations yeah. all the time. Yeah, so, that's it. So we need to be starting at the other end. Yeah. 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 Okay, so um, one of our um, wonderful uh, Nagara Management Committee members, Helen Barrett, has a question for you. Yeah. That is, can you tell us a bit more about uh, the old man and his seven symbols in the sand? Yeah. Um, so it's uh, Juma Fijo. So he's from the Larrakia mob. It's about, he lives about 50k south of Darwin. Um, so I better not actually... <laughs> Sure, he doesn't want everyone turning up on his doorstep. So I think that's about as far as I go with directions to his house. Um, yeah, so he lives in his country there, and he's he's got a big shed where he does a lot of work with the uh, community. Um, yeah, and you know, take people around our country. I'm not sure what he does for a living or how he survives. He just kind of is. Um, yeah, I, like I know a lot of fellows who like who have theories about him. There's this one guy who reckons he's not a he's not a man. <laughs> that he's something else and uh, I'm like nah and then he goes well true have you ever seen him sleep have you ever <laughs> and I'm like and I'm going back over all the times I've camped with him and I'm like that's true I've never seen him sleep <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know if he does sleep you know so he's like um yeah and he kind of, he just knows things, you know, because of his view of time, he kind of sees everything happening at once. So he's always referring to things uh, that you realize later he was referring to what was about to happen, but he was just talking about it in the present tense, you know? Mm -hmm. And then next day or next month or next year, it happens and you're like, ah, oh, okay. <laughs> there. Yeah. So he's, he's just, um, he says a lot of things that just sound insane and irrational and illogical. And you're like, yeah, um, that doesn't fit. That doesn't add up. And then it turns out to be true, <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, so he's just, uh, I don't know. I don't know what he is. I know who he is. I know a lot of his relations. Some of them live down here as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. I uh, just talked to him now and he, he, he goes like, oh, you got to say that word, Mamradaraki, because when he came down here for the book launch, he found this word on the beach with Ani Galdos and he was there with Bunurong Elder on the beach there and they, they found this word there in whatever business, old people business they were doing. And he's, so they were going, you know, Mamradaraki, Mamradaraki. Like, yeah. So I'm just throwing that out into these little airwaves sort of go around the place yeah <laughs> um yeah he's mysterious yeah a lot of those old fellas are right yeah. those knowledge holders they're, yeah they're 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 hard to comprehend mm. yeah and he's cheeky you know so it kind of makes me feel better about my own cheekiness <laughs> like i always think i've got to have more dignitas or something like i've got to be more mm, yes long, long time ago i got to get serious and we've got to do this for our people i've got to i don't know but then i just i can't help it this silliness comes up in me and i just want to be cheeky and silly and have fun and then i see him doing it and i think ah well that's all right then it is all right i, think. I can be a little bit cheeky the world would be dull if I want. If we, if not, if none of us were cheeky. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> so let's see if we can find a cheeky response to this question, which is pretty, you know, it's a pretty big question. Mm. Do you think there's a way out 
of this climate, this the ecological crisis? Well, you know, we're going on a bear hunt. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just given the answer I give to my daughter before. <laughs> we're going on a bear hunt, you know. Oh no, thick oozy mud. What are we going to do? We can't go around it. <laughs> we can't go over it. Oh no, we have to go through it. Yeah. 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 So there's all the wisdom of the ages there in bear hunt. Yeah. So when you walk around the town and you're seeing all the bears up in everybody's windows, have a think about that. You, you're not going to get out of this. You're going to have to go through it. You know. But um, it's it's a lot of fun to bear hunt. Scary as hell. You know. They're, there's white people walking into caves. <laughs> you know, I think one of the things you said before, um, you were referring to an old fellow who, who said that, or, or someone who said that uh, un, until uh, we're not going to be able to sort of make any forward movement really until those old thousand year, thousand year old trees come back. Mm. So, you know, that, that's something that suggests to me that we... We have to um, accept our situation and the ability of what we have to do now mm. um, here is, is to be part of the solution and, and be humble enough to realise that we, we're probably not going to live to see the solution. No. No, not at all. Um, yeah, so, so you know, it, it's about, to me, it's about us, you know, coming to terms with that, but maintaining our responsibility, our commitment to being part of that solution. Yeah. yeah. And, and it seems to me that your book is, is a fantastic contributor to, to that solution, offering practical new ways of thinking about the world um, and as you said you know to to work on ourselves mm. um, as individuals as families as communities and that's certainly what Nagara sets out to do is mm. to, to work as a community to to keep in touch with each other rather you know neoliberalism wants us all in our little individual boxes right mm. um, and and not communicating together and really to push back against that as community, um, making that commitment for the future. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Alana um, would like you to know that your book for her was like a drink of sweet water. So sweet I think that's, water. That's a lovely, a lovely um, way to show her appreciation yeah. of the book. With some flies. Um, oh, no, it wasn't Alana. It was Al Atlanta, I'm sorry. Atlanta. Atlanta. Lloyd Haynes mm. um, has described your work as like a drink of sweet water. Mm. And I think that's a beautiful way to describe um, the messages that you've brought to us through your book. Mm. Sweet. Yeah, sweet. Yeah. yeah. And um, Cam... Um, has has offered an affirmation. Um, he says, when reading your explanation uh, regarding how the smoking ceremony works, um, he felt smoked for several nights with oh. smell of eucalyptus in his sinuses, um, more real than an ordinary dream or even daily life. Um, he says, thank you for what you're manifesting. <laughs> That's mad. Yeah. <laughs> That is mad. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. it just goes to show the power of our 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 complexities. Yeah. Our bodies. Yeah, I I got a lot of you know smoking ceremonies and and I don't feel smoked afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> In some places, you know. Um, so imagine that not going and and nonetheless feeling smoked. Yeah. Yeah. Or reading reading something that's um. Yeah. yeah, pretty cool, right? Yeah, it's wonderful and terrifying all at once. Yeah. So we're coming toward the end of our time together. Um, I would encourage anybody who's been who's in the um, audience to um, add in your um, 
any questions that you might have for Tyson before we all bid each other farewell for the evening? Um, uh, and there's one last question. It's kind, it's kind of takes us back to where we started, Tyson. Yeah. Um, and that is uh, from Val Marsh, who wonders, what is the knowledge that boomers lack? Ah, uh, it's no different from what anyone else is lacking, really. Yeah. It's, um, hey, I, <laughs> I don't think flogging boomers is helping anybody. <laughs> oh, I um, and yeah, I, I, I think it's, there's not much use in looking what, at what people are lacking. You know yourself, Marcel, that's not really been a good policy way forward for us or anybody ever. No. You know, um, it's what, but what do you know? I turn that question back. I say, well, what do you know that can help? Yeah. Because, <laughs> you know, jump in, you need it. Yeah. Yeah. And so what are you, what are you showing us there? I'm just answering one of the questions non-verbally. Oh, so we okay. We probably won't have time to get through. Get to. <laughs> oh, that's uh, showing some <laughs> of the um, the images in the sand. Um, yeah. 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 They're, they're quite beautiful. Yeah, I did um, some sand talk recently with uh, an elder from Central Desert, and that that was pretty special. Yeah. Um, wow. Yeah, but this is just in my kid's sand pit outside. Uh huh. See the blue tub? Yeah. So there's um, old man's model of time there. Wow. It's weird, isn't it? It doesn't look like something that's drawn in the sand. It comes up at you. Yeah, yeah. It is a 3D. Sure is. Thing and it comes out and it's, it's, there's movement in it, you know. And you can see that that's a pattern there. Yeah. yeah. It's funny, like I saw that. I saw that in like a dream kind of state, like about 10 years before old man showed it to me. Before old man Juma showed it to me, but that's the, yeah, that's the model of time, how it works. There really is no division between time and place, time and space either. In our way of looking at things, it's usually we have the same word for that in language. Time and place, the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, there's some of his old man symbols there, and of course here, um, you know, Orion and and the seven sisters, yep, seven spirit families, um, sunrise, sunset, dreaming, and of course the turtle. You know, anybody who's read it, it all comes out from that turtle. Yeah, yeah, and that's the pattern of creation there. You find it, and when you draw it, these hexagons just appear. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You draw it in the sand, you know. You're like, oh, okay. That's it. Just happens. So you don't have to draw a hexagon. You just put those circles together, and the hexagon comes out. Yeah. I guess the same way. We don't need to be designing solutions here. We just need to be following the pattern as much as possible. And if the pattern's true, then the shape of what's right and what needs to emerge will come out the right way. Yeah. Yeah. And probably stop being so nasty to each other on Twitter. Mm. We'll so we've got right um, we've got one last question from Kerry Davies. I think we've got time to to look mm. at that. During the bushfires, we heard the indigenous voice say, "If you abuse the earth, it will destroy you." Um, and uh, Kerry's wondering if you have a comment on that. Yeah, I mean that's that's a bit like feels a bit like something coming from a vengeful God, <laughs> that one. And I guess the, the way I, I prefer to put it in the book is like uh, what all the old people say is if, um, if you don't move with the land, the land will move you. Yeah. Which is kind of a bit more of a gentle way of putting it. But yeah, yeah. Um, but nothing's destroyed. You know, creation's always unfolding. It's nothing's ever destroyed. It just comes back around, yeah. comes through and becomes something else. Things are transformed, not destroyed, you know, and it's a good thing to allow the land to, to not destroy you, to transform you and to try and move with it as much as possible. If you're moving with country, then, um, you know, country will move through you and country will be healthy. You'll be healthy and you'll, you'll get through it. 
Yeah. Um, we're going to be sending everybody a, a post-event email, all of the people who registered to attend the event. We're going to send you an email and we're inviting you to share your experience here tonight. For some of you, it will be, well, the experience was I really couldn't get online. Um, but for those of you who are here to provide feedback about your experience and to help us shape future events so that they, they serve us all well. Um, please continue to ask more questions in relation to our discussion tonight in those emails or, or on our social, Nagara social media or on our website. Um, it'd be great if we could continue this conversation. Um, and, and tell us who else you want to hear from. You know, tonight we heard from Tyson. It was fantastic. Um, give us some ideas of who else you'd like to hear from in future events. And on that, on the topic of future events, um, I encourage everybody to write in their diaries the date of May 27th. Um, as Nagara Institute continues the climate series with a session on climate science. We're going to hear from the scientists. We'll be in conversation with Dr. Tim Cadman, Senior Research Fellow from Griffith, Griffith University, and Dr. Michelle Maloney, convener of the Australian Earth Law Alliance, author and academic, who is also from Griffith University. Um, don't forget to um, join Nagara on Twitter, on Facebook, or sign up to our newsletter on our uh, website homepage. Um, Thanks again, Tyson. That was awesome, fabulous, fantastic. Um, and until next time, everybody, thanks for being here and good night. Good night.